What's going on, everybody? So good to be here. I'm Pastor Doug, and you are watching Pray First. This is the Wednesday edition. Here in February, we are heading towards spring. We're thinking about all the things that spring entails. What is your favorite season? If you're joining us and you can hear me already and you're watching, what is your favorite season? Mine is this year it's going to be spring because I'm sick of cold without snow and all God's people said amen. Morning, Amy, Allen, what's happening? Morning, Kathy and Brandy and Amanda and Raymond and Bonnie. Good morning, Melinda. Good morning, everybody. We're continuing our conversation this morning about people who had face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus, the Son of God. And the story that we're going to read today about this historical account of a particular woman that we do not even know her name describes the character of Jesus and the ministry of the church in amazing ways. Hashtag amazing ways. I'm going to go ahead and share this out. If you would, hashtag live, hashtag recorded. This is an interactive thing that we always do. I'm going to write join us live now on mine and share that out. Also, if you would, everybody, welcome our first time Pray First guests. Hit the hearts. Hit the likes. Go nuts on the buttons. Nuts on the buttons, people. Get your Bibles, get your notepads, get your pen and paper. I hope you have your coffee. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. I recently taught on this particular passage uh, at Cross Point, and I am excited about talking about it today. We're talking about a lady who was caught in a trap. She can't walk out. Because she loves you too much, baby. Why can't you see what you're doing to me when you don't believe a word I say? All right, so this lady, we can go on together with suspicious minds. Suspicious minds! And we can build our dreams. On suspicious minds. All oh, that I love to fight. Anyway, this woman was caught in a trap. Let me tell you something about the enemy before I read this passage. The enemy knows what to bait you with. The enemy knows the things that will attract you. And what's so crazy about our enemy the hunter knows his prey. The hunter knows what to use to lure you, uh, to entice you, to, to get your attention. How many of you out there understand that the hunter knows his prey? That Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That when he's looking for you or when he's trying to trap you, he may not use the same trapping or the same bait that he uses for me. How many of you out there know your bait? <laughs> you don't have to put it out there. You don't have to do any kind of a, this isn't confessional. It's not the booth. But how many of you out there know your, your bait, what it is that attracts you, that it seems like every time you come up on this, you, you, you go for it. I mean, it's like throw caution to the wind, you just go for it, knowing that it's not going to work out well. Well, the enemy knows this lady's bait. She knows that, I mean, he knows, the enemy knows that she needs acceptance. She needs identity. She needs love. She needs uh, compassion. She needs, she needs, she has needs. So the enemy likes to fill those needs. I want to give you a definition for sin this morning uh, that I hope you never forget. And that definition is that sin is a legitimate need filled in an illegitimate way. Let me say that again. Sin is a legitimate need. It's legit. God put a need in you. Sin is filling a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. And so Satan 
will dress it. Satan will, he, he doesn't lie, you know, Satan deceives. There's a little bit of truth with his lie. So he takes the need that you have, the truth, and he mix it with a little bit of lie that he can fill it, and he puts that bait in a snare so that he can snare you. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, he came again to the temple. Jesus at this time is the most respected and revered teacher in the world, okay? And all the people came to him. When Jesus showed up, it was the celebrity pastor guest appearance, okay? At this time, all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. You see, Jesus didn't always have a reputation in the temple that was negative. That comes along with t t teaching the truth. Verse 3, then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. And I have a feeling Jesus may have even been, and I'm speculating, he may have even been teaching on what the law says about marriage and divorce and adultery and, and stoning and the things of that nature. I'm just assuming that. But teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And they said to him, teacher, now Moses' law commands us that she should be stoned. I want you to remember that Moses' law is God's law. Okay. That was the law from God, but they added so much to it and they read so much into it and they expounded and expanded it to cover so many things. So they're trying to trap Jesus and pit Jesus against his father to say that, Jesus, you're teaching this, but look what the word says. Look what, look what the law says of Moses. We've got someone now. We want to see Jesus what you actually do with the law of Moses. Moses' law commands us that she should be stoned. What do you say? You know, we get on to them for this, but that's a legitimate question. That, that was a legitimate question for them to ask. What they did was not necessarily legitimate. It certainly wasn't loving, and that's why Jesus was here. They said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. Well, no kidding. Guys, they had not seen the death, burial, resurrection. They had not seen any of that. Wouldn't you want to know if this was your Messiah? So, I mean, we, we kind of read things in the light of the way we've heard them our entire life. We need to read them in the light of what if I was standing there? Well, what if Jesus came to church today or this person came to church and claimed to be the Messiah? I would run them through the ringer. But Jesus stooped down. Here's where Jesus answers the question. Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he raised up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience <laughs> went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus has raised himself up from the ground where he was writing, he saw no one but the woman. And he said to the woman, where are your accusers? I think it's funny how he identifies them as the accusers because Lucifer is often referred to as the accuser of the brethren. Has no one condemned you? And she said, no, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What an account of a, an interaction between Jesus and this obvious woman living in sin. That's not the question. The question is not whether or not what she was doing was sinful. Yes, it was. The question was not whether or not was she caught. Yes, she was. The question was not whether or not she was a sinner. Yes, she was. But the encounter shows us how Jesus loves sinners. 
the encounter shows us a contrast between being a follower of Christ and a follower of religion or law. You see, Jesus came to let the entire world know that the law had been a tutor, but we weren't in need of a tutor anymore. We now have the Son of God in our midst, and that we were to love one another, not condemn one another. There are many ideas about what Jesus wrote on the ground that day. (laughs) What do you guys think? What do you guys think that Jesus wrote on the ground? Anybody want to give some guesses? Put it over there in the comments. What do you think Jesus, when he stooped down, they're, they're, you know, they're accusing her. They're bringing up these charges against her. They drug her into the church in front of the most famous, respected teacher in in history and, and in that time everybody's at church that day because the special guest preacher, Jesus, is there. These temple folk have gone and sought this woman out because they knew that this was the bait she normally went for. So I feel like she was probably baited again. And they were there, and maybe one of them were part of the bait. Maybe one of them was part of the action. You just never know. But what do you think Jesus wrote on the ground? You know, We don't know because it's not written in Scripture what he wrote on the ground. But we do know whatever he wrote on the ground, it convicted them. It convicted the accuser's conscience. This woman is humiliated. This woman is embarrassed. This woman is guilty. This woman is ashamed. This woman didn't make a mistake. This woman made a decision. This woman was a sinner. This woman is drugged from her place, thrown into the temple at the feet of Jesus. And, and we just we can we can do some guessing about what he wrote since we don't know, but whatever it was, it was so enlightening to the accusers that they let the law of Moses go. I want you to think about that. They asked Jesus, what do you think about the law of Moses? Well, he didn't deny the law of Moses. He didn't say that that's not my father's word, that's not my father's law. He just ignored their question. Guys, you don't have to answer every question you're asked, and you don't have to have an answer for every question you're asked. He just bends down and acts like he doesn't hear them, and I'm going to assume maybe He wrote their names in the dirt because I'm sure they came with anonymity and they didn't want anybody to know who he They surely didn't want him to know their name. And he probably wrote, well, you, you cheated on your taxes. He probably wrote, you're a pervert. He probably wrote, you know, you're a drunk. He, he, he probably, he wrote something that silenced the mouths of the accusers that brought them under, listen to me, that brought them under Moses' crushing law. And when they all had their rocks in their hand, ready to stone someone under the law of Moses, and Jesus wrote whatever he wrote, whatever he wrote brought them under the conviction of the law that, hey, if I throw a rock at her, someone's got to throw a rock at me. Woo! That's big time. Listen, there is a principle here at hand about judgment. And people say, you know, you can't judge me, don't judge me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that the church is not here to judge the world. We're not here to condemn the world. We're not here to condemn anybody. But you can judge fellow believers. You can judge fellow followers. You can judge those who have signed up for a standard, and you judge them by the word of God. So we see that this woman is cast at his feet. He has an opportunity to increase his fame. I promise you it would have been a political maneuver that would have uh, uh, garnered him more respect in the temple and probably more respect from Rome. This divine encounter, we look at how she meets the most famous Christian, respected teacher in the world, and Jesus looks at her and says, lady, where are your accusers? 
I want to say something to you today. Jesus looks at this woman caught in the very act, guilt, shame, fear, condemnation, guilt, and says, don't look at them. Don't look at the high priest. Don't look at the temple guard. Don't look at all the temple lights. Don't look at Moses' law. Don't look at those who drug you here. Don't look at your past. Don't look at your present. Don't look at the trap. Don't look at your shame. Don't look at your guilt. Don't look at your fear. Lady, look at me. And when she looked into the eyes of the standard, when she looked into the eyes of the Son of God, when she looked into the eyes of perfection and love, he says these words. He says, you know, I don't do anything unless I see my Father doing it. I don't speak anything unless I hear my Father saying it. He is representing God the Father. And when he looks at this sinner and he says, I do not condemn you. That is a powerful teaching as to the character of God. It is a powerful teaching as to the response of the church to a sinful, guilty, shameful, condemned world that I represent my Father. I represent my Savior. World, I don't condemn you. Because I understand that golfers golf, hunters hunt, fishermen fish, and sinners sin. That's right. <laughs> I understand and I am not shocked. I, I, you know, I can't fathom nor can I grasp this church is the world's church, the, the kingdom church, the church's position. I can't grasp the church's position on how we can't believe what the world is doing politically with pro choice or, or pro life. We can't believe what the world is doing. We can't believe that the world is so dark. We can't believe that the world is so detached. Why can't we believe that? I don't understand why we are so, oh, can you believe they said that? Oh, can you believe they did that? Jesus never did that. Jesus understood that sinners sin. Here's what I don't understand. I don't understand how we are so shocked that the world sins without the Holy Spirit when followers of Christ sin with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, I, huh? I don't understand why we're so shocked that the world sins without the Holy Spirit when you and I, followers of Jesus, sin with the Holy Spirit. He's inside of us. Empowered. Guys, we live in a broken world, and Jesus says in John 3, 16, the brokenness, the messiness, the disturbedness, the darkness drew me to you, for God so loved the messy world that he came and gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed, and then John 3, 17, I did not come, I did not come. I, Jesus said, Jesus could not have been more crystal clear. Jesus said, I did not come to the world to condemn the world but that through me they might be saved. Woman caught in adultery, don't look at your accusers. Don't look at your past. Don't look at your sin you're in right now. I do not condemn you. Grace. And then with equal measure, Jesus says, go and sin no more. Grace and truth. Not more of one than the other, not less of one than the other. Equal measure, Jesus speaks grace and and truth. The number one thing we see from this today is Jesus does not condemn. Hashtag number one, Jesus does not condemn. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that through the encounter 
that your scripture has maintained for us through the centuries, that we can get a glimpse into what God the Father would say to a sinner, that through this passage we can get a glimpse at what God the Father would do to the sinner. Lord, if we want to know what we should do in a situation, that we can look at what Jesus did. That if we want to know what we should say to someone in a situation, we can look to what Jesus said. There is still a lot of self-righteousness in us. There is so much pride in us. There, 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 there are so many stones in our pocket to throw at people who, who sin different than, are different than our own. Father, give us the truth behind grace and truth. Help us to love those who are caught in a trap. Like you have loved us who have been or who are caught in a trap. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Hashtag live, hashtag recorded. Quit being so shocked at what the world is doing. Stop throwing rocks at each other. I feel like we're on the playground. Stop throwing rocks, okay? Stop throwing rocks. It is not our rocks that lead people to repentance. It is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Hashtag live, hashtag recorded, hashtag shared. Get out of here. <laughs> hey, Chip, I'm praying for Wendy and you today. The PET scan results, also for the second chemo. I'm praying for you. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, let that chemo go well today. Let it not make her sick. Let it accomplish what you want to accomplish and bring healing to her in Jesus' name. Hey, Mike Doddridge, I'm praying for you today, man. Know that you lost your, your father last night. We're praying for you. We love you. Lord, give him peace that surpasses understanding in Jesus' name. Um, continuing to pray for all of those prayer requests that you gave me. I, I have a list of about 16 prayer requests from the other day, and I'm praying for them each day. So if you have a prayer request, drop it in our group page. I love you guys. See y'all later. I really do pray for you. I do think about you beyond this broadcast. And I'll see you tomorrow.